For some of you, this is really the first taste of who I am, and this is the first impression that I'm going to make upon you, and I want it to be a good one. That's another thing that I have to accomplish with these words, is give you a, a glimpse as to who I am and what lights my fire and gets me out of bed and why I do this. Some of you will draw conclusions based upon these words, and, and your unspoken questions will be answered based upon the things that I say, so I want to try and make sure those are good answers and that those are good conclusions. I want to make a good first impression. And again, that's not the main reason why I'm preaching this morning, but that is an objective, if I'm being honest with you. But probably the thing that you are most curious about, and the most important thing that needs to happen this morning, there has to be some sort of idea or some direction put forward so that you know that we're going someplace together should we partner together in ministry. I mean, it's not going to be a detailed 10-step program or anything like that for the next 10 years, but at the very least, there has to be a trajectory set this morning because nobody wants to follow the guy who doesn't know where he's going, right? So you take all of these tasks together and you start adding them up and very quickly I realized there is no way that any one sermon could possibly bear up under all this weight. So yeah, I thought about this a lot. So that this past Friday when my wife asked me, honey, what are you going to preach on? I knew in the depths of my heart without a shadow of a doubt the answer. And I looked her in the face with all the boldness and confidence that any earthly man could muster. I said to her, I don't know. This is a big deal. <laughs> no, I, I got to come clean with you. That last part didn't actually happen. <laughs> now, the truth is I've known for a little while now what I was going to preach on, and it really wasn't that hard of a decision. Because if there's one passage that I could show you that's going to give you a glimpse of who I am and, and what drives me, and one passage that I could preach from that's going to give you a glimpse of, of what a future together might look like, it's going to be in the book of John, chapter 3. If you've got your scriptures with you this morning, be they on your phone, your tablet, or one of these ancient relics called a book, I invite you to flip open to John chapter 3. I understand that usually the passage is on the screen up here, and I have to confess that in the hustle and bustle, I drop the ball on that, so it won't be up there this morning. However, you're in luck, because our passage this morning is a story, and stories are meant to be heard and listened to. So if you don't have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to just listen to the story as it unfolds for you this morning. Again, that's John chapter 3 is where we're going to be. Now, this is a story that takes place in the early, early days of Jesus' ministry, really before he has gained much notoriety or significance on the stage of influence in Israel. It's verse 22 is where we're going to begin. It goes like this. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. Let's just pause there for a moment. The John that's being mentioned here, this is not John that wrote the book, this is John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin. And John the Baptist had his own God-ordained ministry. It was his job to be preparing the hearts and the minds of the people for the coming of Jesus. And he'd been at this for a little while now. We're not entirely sure how long at this point. But it was long enough that he had gained some notoriety. And people knew who he was. He had gained enough popularity, in fact, that he's at this place called Anon. And we aren't real sure exactly where that's at, but it's a place with a lot of water, we read. And he needed access to all this water because, as we also just read, people were constantly coming to be baptized. So John has gained, gained some popularity, he's gained some momentum on the public stage. And that's an important detail to keep in the back of our minds, because it's the backdrop against which this whole ordeal unfolds. Let's look back at our passage. Look at verse 25. It says, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan the one you testified about, and they're talking about Jesus there. Well, he's baptizing, and everyone's going to him. So John's disciples are out and about, and they come across a, a gentleman. We don't know anything about him other than he's Jewish, but this is first century Israel, so that narrows it down to everybody. Um, and we, they get into an argument, and we don't really know much about the argument other than it has something to do with Jewish cleansing rituals. The argument's not really that important either. 
The only reason it's mentioned is to let us know that this is how Jesus gets on the radar of John's disciples. You know, they're going back and forth, and, and Jesus gets brought up, and they're kind of like, whoa, 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 back up the bus. Who? He's doing what now? And this raises some concerns. So they go back to John the Baptist, and they report. And their report, if we were to keep reading, which we'll get there in a moment, their report is really more of a complaint. They come to John as if Jesus is a problem. John, this Jesus guy whom you baptized, well, now he's baptizing, and everybody's going over to him. And the unspoken question on their lips is, John, what are you going to do about it? In their eyes, Jesus is a problem that needs to be solved because as he gains significance and as he becomes greater, they feel challenged in their own significance and in their own greatness. And it's kind of a scary thing when competition comes to town. I remember uh, in Salem, Illinois, where I grew up, the main grocery store in town for years was the local IGA. That's just where everybody went to get their food. That is until rumors started to swirl around that our dinky, regular old Walmart was about to become a super Walmart. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Walmart's business strategy or the vast variety of stores that they have, so I'll I'll clarify if you're not familiar. Dinky old regular Walmarts sell things like bleach and batteries, but if you want your meat or your produce or something, you got to go to a different store. Now, just imagine having to go to two different stores to get all your shopping done. These were dark and primitive times, people. But somehow, by the grace of God, we made it through. And today, Walmart is your one-stop shop where you can get your batteries and bleach and your meat and produce, and you can get your tires changed and your oil changed. You can drop off your paycheck, get your haircut, get some eyeglasses, grab a Subway sandwich, and who knows? In the future, you may draw blood there and give your baby, or deliver your baby there as well. Walmart is a very enterprising company. But that's really another story for another day. So in my hometown, rumor came that our Walmart was going to become a super Walmart, and that meant competition for the local IGA. And I happened to work for the owner of the IGA at the time, and I watched him fight Walmart tooth and nail at every opportunity he had. You know, he opposed the building permits that Walmart needed for their new construction, and he opposed the liquor license that they filed for. And after they got their license, his convictions miraculously changed, and he filed for his own liquor license. He did everything he could to either outdo or undo Walmart, because when competition comes to town, it's scary. It's this swirling mixture of of fear and anxiety and uncertainty, and it's a challenging time. And that's what John's disciples are feeling. They are feeling challenged by the growing greatness of Jesus In their minds, this is kind of a Wild West showdown situation, you know. This town ain't big enough for the both of us. And you know something? They were absolutely right. As Jesus would grow in significance and greatness, they would be challenged. Their significance would be challenged. Their own greatness would be challenged. And what was true for them so long ago is still very true for us today. As Jesus becomes greater in our lives, as he becomes more significant and more important to us, he challenges us. He challenges our own sense of self-significance, our own sense of greatness. And it can be challenging and kind of scary at times when Jesus comes to town, so to speak. I know a man who, ironically enough, is also named John. A lot of Johns in this sermon, I apologize, but this is a different guy. And John is one of the best men that I know. Uh, He was a good kid growing up, too. But like all good kids, John did some dumb things in high school. And one of the dumb things that John did involved the way that he uh, spoke to and kind of mistreated some people in his class. I think we all can probably relate to that to some extent. Uh, But most of us, we forget about the mean things we said. We, We move on with our lives. We just try to do better as adults. But not John. Now, John did something very unusual. Years and years after he graduated, he made it a point to find these people that he had spoken to poorly. And he didn't send them a Facebook message, and he didn't write a letter. He picked up a phone, and he asked for forgiveness. And he asked that they would just just accept him and accept his words. That's kind of a weird thing to do in this day and age, honestly. 
You know, who, who would go to the trouble of finding these people and drudging up all of these memories that probably most people have forgotten about? You need a really good reason to have to do something that awkward and uncomfortable. And John did have a good reason. It was Jesus. Because Jesus had become more and more significant to John and had become greater and more important in his life to the point that John knew that he had to take a step in following him, a step that would humble him, a step that would challenge him. In this case, it meant taking seriously what Jesus teaches about forgiving and being forgiven. So he picked up the phone and he started calling. And he admits it was awkward and it was uncomfortable. And there were times where he felt absolutely foolish, but he knew that if he was going to continue following Jesus, this is what the next step looked like for him. So he continued. And as uncomfortable and as challenging as it was, John also says it was liberating and transformative and healing for wounds he didn't even know he had. And there are things like that that make John somebody that looks more like Jesus than anybody I've ever met in my life. As Jesus becomes more important to us, church, as he becomes greater, he challenges us to become less. That's the challenge of following Jesus. And there are different ways that people respond to that challenge. We actually see one of them in John's disciples. When they hear of Jesus' growing greatness, they dig in their heels and they resist. You know, they very accurately understand that as Jesus becomes more important, they will be challenged to become less important in themselves. And so they go to John and complain. And this whole situation is kind of funny to me, and it's probably funny to you too, if you know the kinds of things that John the Baptist was preaching and teaching. In fact, let's just look at one of those real quick. If you were to flip in in my Bible, it's just one page, but it may be more in yours. We look at John chapter 1, verse 29. Just listen to the kinds of things he was preaching. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And this is the part I want to draw attention to. The reason I came baptizing with water, and and I'm going to add a word just for emphasis here. The whole reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it kind of sounds like John not only expected the rise of Jesus, but he was endorsing it because John understood that God had this big, huge, audacious plan and that he himself, John, was not the center of it. It was through Jesus that God was going to reveal himself in this whole new way to humanity. And it was through Jesus that God was going to deal with the weight of the world's sin and finally blot it out. And it was through Jesus that God was going to offer this gift of life that doesn't stop at the grave. Jesus was the focal point and the centerpiece of this big, huge, audacious plan that God had had in the works since the beginning of time. John got this, but somewhere along the lines, his disciples missed it because they find themselves digging in their heels and resisting Jesus, the center point of God's plan. Which, if you think about it, means they actually were resisting God Almighty himself. I don't think the word oops is big enough to cover a mistake of that magnitude, right? This is a big deal. But we can't be too hard on them, really, because the same thing happens in our day and age as well. Jesus grows in significance and importance in our lives. As he becomes greater, he challenges us to take uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order to move closer to him. But it's very tempting to resist that challenge. My grandmother uh, was a CNA at the hospital in Salem for, I think, her entire working life. Uh, and she was, enjoyed it a great deal, did it for, like I said, a number of years. But towards the end of her career, she took kind of a nasty spill at work and she injured her leg. And she was an older woman when this happened, and and she was kind of a heavier person, and so it was important that she underwent physical therapy to make sure her leg was fully healed, that she regained the strength, and that she could be mobile and functional again. But my grandmother was never one to embrace a challenge. And she was uh, somebody that that never really embraced pain either. Physical therapy is both of those things, challenging and painful. 
So she went for a couple of sessions, but, but after about one or two, she said, yeah, I think I'm done. And her kids begged her, my aunts, my uncles, my mom, you know, mom, if you don't do your physical therapy, you, you may not walk again. But it didn't really matter. She dug in her heels and she resisted the challenge. She embraced what was comfortable and what was contenting, what was familiar, not realizing that what she was actually resisting was her shot of a healthy, functional, independent future. Sometimes we don't realize what exactly we are resisting. And that's true with Jesus as well. You know, when he calls us to take that uncomfortable step away from ourselves in order to move closer to him, it can be a challenging thing. And we're tempted to resist when he calls us to, to cut that sin out of our lives that is so comfortable and so contenting. And it's tempting to resist whenever he calls us to pick up the phone and ask for forgiveness. And it's tempting to resist whenever he challenges us to show mercy to that person that we don't even like, frankly. And it's tempting to resist whenever he challenges us to, to put down the TV remote and pick up the Bible and read for just 30 minutes or, or to stop talking on the phone or stop texting and pray for 20, 30 minutes a day. It's tempting to resist because the alternative is so much more comfortable and familiar and contenting. But when we do that, like John's disciples, I don't think we always realize what exactly we're resisting. We're resisting God Almighty and his dream for our lives. You know that God has a dream for your life, right? You know, you maybe haven't heard that phrase before. Maybe you've heard God's plan or God's will for your life. I like the term dream because it's something that desperately wants to be achieved, but it takes effort to get there. And that's what God desires of our lives. His burning desire, if you were to look at the pages of the New Testament, is for us to look like Christ in the way that we think, in the way that we speak, in the way that we act, in the way that we love and relate to others. If you want to put a Bible phrase on it, his dream is that we would be conformed to the image or to the likeness of his son. That's what God desires most of all for our lives. And that doesn't just happen. It doesn't just materialize without some effort. That's why I call it a dream. It's something that takes a process of development and growth, and that process involves taking uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order to move closer to Jesus. Sometimes when we resist that plan, we don't realize who or what exactly we're resisting. My grandmother, she resisted physical therapy, and, and as a result, she spent the remainder of the rest of her life in the recliner of her living room of her home. And sometimes... Good, God-honoring Christian people wind up the same way, parked in spiritually easy chairs, with our feet kicked up in the air, instead of on the path of taking steps towards Jesus. I mean, just let that image sink in for a minute. I have a real hard time accepting that that's what Jesus imagined when he had nails driven through his feet, us with ours kicked in the air, taking it easy. Folks, this is the challenge of following Jesus taking uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order to move closer to him. And one way we could react to that is to resist. Now, I don't advise that, but that is one option. A far better option is what we see in the reaction of John the Baptist. If you want to get your scriptures again, look at verse 27. It says, To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I, I'm not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom, and the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it's now complete. I love this verse. He must become greater, and I must become less. So John's disciples come to him with this problem of Jesus, and his response is far different from theirs. He explains to them, fellas, God has a plan and I'm not the center of it. It's my job just to make sure that Jesus takes center stage. And if that's happening, I'm happy. Mission accomplished. And he kind of compares himself to the best man at a wedding. It's a little different in the first century, but it still, it still applies today. Uh, a few years back, I was a groomsman in my best friend's wedding. Um, and all the other groomsmen were great guys, but they couldn't run their own lives. I wasn't going to let them run this weekend. They just didn't have the organizational skills. 
Uh, and so I kind of took charge there, and I did a lot of work to make sure this weekend was a good weekend. I planned the bachelor party. We drove from Joplin to St. Louis. We had a great time there. I got everybody back in one piece. I got most everybody back in one piece. I think there's one guy we left there. I'm not kidding when I say that. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, I helped decorate the chapel and the reception hall. As far as the groomsmen went, I made sure everybody was where they needed to be, when they needed to be there with the stuff that they needed. It was a lot of work babysitting five grown men, I'll tell you. But I did it. And do you know that at no time during that wedding ceremony did anybody bother to bring me up on stage and thank me for all my work? The nerve, right? Now, of course they didn't do that because that's not the role I was meant to play as the groomsman. It was my job just to get my friend and his bride on that stage to stand back and take joy in the fact that I had a part to play in their story. And John is saying the same thing here. He's saying, I'm Jesus' best man. If he's taking the reins, if he is taking center stage, I'm happy, guys. And he sums up this whole concept and this whole attitude in verse 30. And like I said, I love verse 30. I've thought about getting a tattoo of verse 30, but then I picture myself as a grown man weeping in a tattoo parlor, and I'm reminded why I don't have tattoos. But I love this verse. He must become greater. I must become less. And when you hear that, I want you to hear the necessity in those words. This isn't just a nice thought. This isn't something that John kind of hopes happens someday. It'd be sweet if it did. No, this is something that must happen. He must become greater. And conversely, I must become less. I love hearing this verse in different translations too. In the English Standard Version, it's, he must increase, but I must decrease. In the New English translation, it's he must become more important while I become less important. I love hearing this verse again and again and again because every time I hear it, it reminds me of my proper place in the kingdom of God. It is not standing center stage. What's ironic I'm saying that now. It's not to stand center stage in the spotlight. I'll go over here so I can say that. It's not to stand center stage in the spotlight. And my role in the kingdom is not to take the reins. My role is to become less and make sure that Jesus becomes greater. And that's my job and your job, and all of our jobs as the church. He must become greater. And you know how that happens? It happens when you and I take uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order for him to become greater, in order to follow him. I want you to think just for a moment in your minds what a literal picture of following somebody looks like. You played follow the leader as a kid, right? That wasn't outdated by apps and smartphones. We still played that. Shake your heads. Okay, you're all awake with me. Good. So we know how to play follow the leader. You follow the leader, right? Going where they go. When was the last time you ever saw somebody follow from the front? Never, right? Because that's called leading. But many times that's our imagination or our, our depiction of how we follow Jesus. I'm going to go where I want to go in my life in the manner that I want to go there, doing the things that I want to do in the lifestyle that I want to live. But Jesus, you come along with me because I'm following you. Really? Because that's not the picture that I get here when I look at John. I hear John say, he must become greater and I must become less, even if he challenges me in uncomfortable ways even if he challenges me to humble myself, even if he challenges me to put his priorities above my own, Jesus is a challenging guy as he becomes more and more important in our lives, but it's a challenge worth embracing. I have a one-year-old son named Levi. You'll probably see him run around here uh, later today. I had the pleasure of watching him learn how to walk recently. And it was funny. He would stand up and look at the ground and kind of furrow his brow like he knew where he wanted to go, he just wasn't real sure how to get there. And he would stare, and eventually he got the courage to take that first shaky step. And you know what happened? He fell. He just laid there and cried. He wasn't hurt, he was just fussing. But he had a dad who picked him up and set him back on his feet and said, all right, buddy, try it again. Come to dad. And he would look at the ground and he'd take that shaky step and he fell again and we'd pick him up again and I'd say, buddy, try it again. Come to dad. 
And eventually he took that first step. And then he took another. And then he took another. And today he runs. And I kind of wish he hadn't taken the first step. (laughs) But folks, that's what it's like when Jesus challenges us to follow. He challenges us to take uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order to move closer to him. Are you sick of hearing that phrase yet this morning? If so, you've almost heard it enough. He challenges us to take steps. And that first step is shaky. And you know what? You're probably going to fail. You're probably going to fall. But you have a father, too, who's not content to leave you fussing in the dirt, but is going to pick you up. And by the power of his grace, is going to set you on your feet to try it again. And he's going to say, all right, son, all right, daughter, come to dad. And there will come a day, so long as you persist, where you will take that step closer to Jesus. And you will take another, and you will take another, until you two are running after Christ to seize the fullness of life that he has in store for you. Church, we don't fail by trying to follow Jesus and falling. We fail by standing still. We fail by kicking our feet up in spiritual easy chairs and resisting the challenge of following our Lord. We fail when we resist taking uncomfortable steps away from ourselves in order to move closer to Him. God's grace is big enough to cover the falls, but it's up to us to choose to follow Jesus. So here's my encouragement and my challenge to you this morning. There's a step in your life that you need to take. And I would bet dollars to donuts, you already have a pretty good idea of what it is. For some of you, it's that first step. You need to turn your life over to Christ and say, I need your cross and your work on that cross to wash me clean. I need that forgiveness. I need that life. I need this fresh start, Jesus. I need you in my life in a bad way. For some of you, that's the first step is just making him your Lord. For others of you, there may be a step that increases your holiness and your obedience. There may be something that he says in this book that you know in your heart is true, but but you resist living it out because it's comfortable and it's familiar and it's contenting. The challenge for you this morning is to take the uncomfortable step away from ourselves in order to make him even greater in your life. For others, maybe you're at a place where you are obedient and Christ is your Lord, but your, your faith and your growth has kind of plateaued a little bit. For you, this next step, it may be simply getting more involved in church. We've got small groups that are going to be starting up in September, I believe it is. We've got ministries here and opportunities for you to serve. Spiritual growth doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. And maybe for you, the step you need to take is getting plugged in. There are a hundred other possible steps out there. But like I said, I think you probably have a pretty good idea of what Jesus is calling you to this morning. And so I want to encourage you and challenge you. Take that step and commit yourself to making him even greater in your life and in this world. So that's the first sermon. It's in the books. And I think it accomplished everything we set out to do. Because if you want to know who I am, a little bit about what gets me going, it's in these words. I'm somebody trying to take steps. I'm somebody who falls sometimes, and I love the grace of God for picking me up and giving me another chance. And I'm somebody who likes to see other people take steps too. And if you want to know where we might be headed together as a church, that's in here as well. We will be a church singularly focused on making Jesus even greater in individual lives, in this congregational life, in the life of this community and the world. And that happens by helping people take steps. Now, as far as whether or not this was a good sermon... Most of you look like you're awake, so I'm going to chalk this up as a win, okay? (laughs) I know, I set a very high bar for myself, but I'll take what I can get. This is my first outing. I've had a lot of fun with all of you this weekend and getting to know some of you, but I hope that the fun and the festivities that are going to continue throughout the day, I hope that doesn't overshadow the challenge that you just heard. There's a step that needs to be taken in your life, whether you're just starting out in the faith or you've been at it for 50, 60, 70 years. Embrace the challenge and make Jesus even greater in your life. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in awe of your greatness. 
And we thank you for bringing us into your family. We thank you for your concern for our well-being and for our futures. And I pray that your dream would become a burning desire in our hearts as well, that we would want to be like Jesus. Father, reveal to us the steps that we need to take and give us the courage to take those steps. I pray that you would lead us and guide us in these endeavors, encourage us throughout the whole journey. And Father, I just pray that Jesus would be even greater in our lives and in this community because of this church. We thank you for your greatness. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.